Now, here's what I want to show you in the scriptures. There are three basic images, three primary images of divine covering in scripture. I love word pictures, do you? So I'm going to tell you what kind of word pictures go with it. Three, there, there are a number of kinds of coverings uh, in the scripture, but when it comes to divine cover, three primary images of divine covering in scripture. We got a cover above, a cover above. So something in scripture will convey that we or the person or the nation has a cover over us. Does that make sense? A cover overhead. This we would see in scripture um, ordinarily in some kind of context where it talks about God sheltering us, sheltering us that there is a shelter overhead. One of the things that's interesting about this um, is that if we were looking at this particular imagery, we would still be able to see all manner of storm around us. But we're standing in the shelter. You understand what I'm saying? Where it could just be pouring rain out here, a tornado of wind out here. But while our eyes can see all of it and behold every bit of it, somehow there is this image, there is this word picture in the scripture of being sheltered by God. So it's a covering above. Everybody say covering above. So there's three primary images of divine covering in scripture. And the first one is what? Covering above. Then I want you to see with me the second one is cover in front, a cover in front. And it might be, we're going to see it from both sides of the cover. It may be that even God is behind this particular cover. There's for some reason a veil between us and him that of course we're going to see in scripture or that we have been covered by something over us and that at times we cannot even see what's on the other side of it. At times, we're going to realize as we study divine cover that we're like sheltered by something while we're still watching the fury of it. Have you ever also realized you've been in a terrible storm you did not even know you were in? That maybe something happened at your workplace and you were like, I had no idea that was even going on. If I'd had any idea of that. Maybe you got protected from something relational. Something in your church of a catastrophe. And somehow like it, the whole thing was covered. There you were covered and protected from it. And you did not even know it was happening. Somehow veiled from it. There's a shelter overhead. There's the cover in front. And then there's this wonderful, wonderful third one. Would everybody tell me the first two? Cover where? And then cover. And then we have a cover around where the individual herself, himself, out here in the elements, covered, is covered. All three types we see in the scriptures, divine cover, a shelter over our heads from a storm raging around us, sometimes something that is veiled in front of us, other times, right out in the midst of it. But we are covered by God. How in the world can you call this covering when I have been through this kind of crisis, this kind of heartbreak, this kind of suffering, this kind of disease? And we're going to see the answer to that question. So think with me about divine cover in the Old Testament. It all began where Adam and Eve, when they were tempted um, to eat what the one thing that had been forbidden them, and they realized that they were naked, and so they took fig leaves and they sewed them together and they covered themselves. That was the first cover. So it starts right there. And then in verse 21, we are told, so you see the counter of God's cover 
instantly because he turns right back around and he exchanges their fig leaves that they've sewn together, their self-cover, for the true cover. He takes animal skins and covers them. So something has died. There has been bloodshed in order for them to be, what is our key word? covered. That's Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 6 then talks about how the entire world had become corrupt and it was filled with violence. Does that sound familiar to anyone in the room? I mean, just like global corruption doesn't mean there's nobody good in this world. Doesn't mean there's no godliness in this world. But like just a, a globe that is being characterized by corruption and violence. The world, it says that in Genesis, that in that day and time, every man's thought, every woman's thought, that it was just like evil. That the imaginations of their hearts were just evil, except for Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man and an unrighteous generation. And so it doesn't use the word covered right there, but it says that the world was just filled with corruption and violence. So picture that with me, because the next thing we see in every single one of these verses will use the word cover. The next thing we see is that in Genesis 6, 14, God tells Noah that he is to make an ark of wood, and he's to make rooms in the ark, and he is to cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, what he was doing, he was taking uh, something you and I would think of as tar, and um, he was painting it on the inside and on the outside so that it would stay afloat and so none of the floodwaters would get inside the ark. He literally covered it with pitch on the inside and the outside so that it would be watertight. No water was getting in. I love that image. Because listen, there is no sinking the ship of divine redemption. There's no way to sink it. You cannot sink the ship of divine redemption. When that ship starts sailing, and if you're in it, you are going to be covered. And it will be a divine work of God. That is how he works. I want you to imagine it with me because this word right here, kafar, that is the word that is used for covering that is elsewhere when it is used in a different form, elsewhere used throughout the Old Testament as the word that means atonement or a big theological word that means the same thing, propitiation. It's something that that covers, that's smeared, that rubs out. And then it says that then the waters cover the whole earth and even the high mountains were covered. And then it tells us in Genesis chapter 8 that Noah took the cover off of the ark and he saw that there was land and and the land was dry. Then we go forward to the time when God calls one man by the name of Abram and builds a nation out of him. We see the patriarchal period with the son um, uh, Isaac and the grandson Jacob and all the sons of Jacob. And it establishes the people of promise. Then the book of Exodus opens with an oppressed people crying out. You know what? God never misses the cry of the oppressed. Not ever. When we cry out to God, our God hears us and he came to their rescue. And what we're told then is in the next time we see covering come into play, God has called the Hebrew people out of their bondage into the wilderness and he has called them together around a mountain and his glory comes down in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 15. It says that the cloud covered the mountain. And that we're told in Exodus 24, 16, that the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, covered the mountain. The cloud covered it for six solid days. You want to hear something fascinating? I, 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 don't know, I don't even know what to do with this. In Psalm 104, verse 2, we're told that God covers himself with light as with a garment. When we talk about God covering us, you need to know he covers himself. That literally, he covers his own being with light 
like a garment and he settles on top of this mountain and he begins to tell the people of Israel what he wants to do for them and what he wants them to do in his name. And he tells them after all this time, here comes the redemption when he says, I want you to make a tabernacle according to the pattern that I will give you, exactly like the pattern I will give you. And you will make it and I will come and meet with you. The whole object of scripture from Genesis to Revelation is man leaving the intimate presence of of God, where they were able to literally walk with God in that garden, and his pursuit of man, his willingness to come to us until he could prepare a place for us to come to him. Covering, covering, covering. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. He gives them instructions for how to build this tabernacle where he will meet with them, and his glory will literally settle upon it. It will cover it. And he tells them that back in the Holy of Holies, they are to place an Ark of the Covenant that they are to build. And he gives it very specific directions. And on the top of it, there is a lid that very often you will see in Scripture referred to as a mercy seat. A mercy seat. I want you to hear this in Exodus 25. I'm going to pick up at verse 17. It says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. In verse 18, and you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work, shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. And it says then that one with one piece with the mercy seat, you shall make the cherubim on the two ends, verse 29, or verse 20 rather. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. And it talks about this being on the top of the um, altar or the Ark of the Covenant. And then it says, there I will meet with you, verse 22. There I will meet with you. If you've got an NIV, how many of you have an NIV in the room? You are seeing the word, instead of mercy seat, what two words are you seeing? Tell me. Atonement cover or cover. Atonement cover. This is the reason why in the ESV the word cover is used about 211 times, whereas in the NIV it is used 241 times. Because over and over again, instead of using the word mercy seat, either one, seat or cover, could be a proper rendering for this Hebrew word. But over and over again, the NIV is translating it atonement cover. Why? Because it's a form of that same word for cover that we saw a moment ago. This time it is in a noun form, and it's the word cop. Kaporet, kaporet. It's the word from which we get Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement. In other words, that's an atonement cover. And once a year on the day of atonement, those priests, the high priests, would be allowed to go back in behind the heavy curtain of the Holy of Holies. And he would literally sprinkle blood from the sacrifice on top of that mercy seat. And that's where God would meet with them. And that was the covering of their redemption. Over and over, cover goes. Exodus 26, 13, in the instructions about the curtains over the tabernacle, it said that it would cover, that these skins and these curtains and these fabrics would cover it. It brings us to Exodus 40, 34, that says, then when it was complete, this is the very end of the book of Exodus, when it was complete, that the glory of the Lord, the cloud covering the Lord literally settled down upon the tabernacle and it says it covered it. It kept it covered throughout all of their years of wandering. A cloud by day and a fire by night. Whole thing gets repeated except for the traveling part and the fire. Whole thing gets repeated again when they have a permanent dwelling place under Solomon's rule for Solomon's temple. Once again, we're told that the cloud of God's glory comes and covers it. 
This is a rendering of the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to see it with me. This is what would have been in behind that heavy veil. So that priest would have gone in behind it. That would have been seated right in front of him. And that mercy seat or atonement cover is what is on the top with the cherubim overlooking it extremely important because that was the dwelling place of God among men. It was true in Solomon's temple as well, and it brings us to Isaiah 22, 5 through 8. Now, let me tell you a little story. Let me give you a little background here before we wrap up this lesson tonight. God told his people, Israel, I'm going to just put it in, um, in a, a form of paraphrase here, so that we can just uh, cut to the chase. He basically let them get away with a whole lot of things. He knew, I mean, he knows that we are dust. He knows that we walk on feet of clay. He knows man, he knows our hearts. And there is forgiveness for sin. But, but I, I want you to understand one of the things that he said to Israel that was extremely important. He's, he basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'll put up with a lot of things out of you. But you worshiping other gods is going to get on my last nerve. <laughs> and so they, they would do it. They would get trapped into the practices of the other nations. And they would leave their God and their devotion to him. And they'd start acting like the rest of the world. And he would warn them, come back. Warn them, come back. Warn them, return warn them, return, and when they would be warned over and over again and told over and over again by his prophets, return to the Lord, that your sins would be wiped out and you would be restored. They were told over and over and over again, but when they would not do it and there was no other way for him to get their attention, he would allow them to go into bondage. It happened in the northern part of Israel with the Assyrians, and roughly 100 years later, it happened again with the Babylonians. And I want to pick up here in Isaiah 22, and I want to read this to you. There'll be a part of it that will seem like you'll get a little bit lost in it, but it's going to land in a verse that you can well understand, and I can well understand Verse 5, Isaiah 22, verse 5 says this, For the Lord God of hosts has a day of tumult and trampling and confusion in the valley of vision, a battering down of walls, that's important, and a shouting to the mountains. And Elam bore the quiver with chariots and horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. Your choicest valleys were full of chariots, and the horsemen took their stand at the gates. Verse 8, He has taken away the covering of Judah. He has taken away the covering of Judah. He had told them over and over again, return to the Lord, return to the Lord. And they had refused. He did not take their God, but for a while, he took their covering where he had said, when you're obedient to me, you will never meet a foe you cannot conquer. Never. That had been told them over and over again from the earliest conquest. If they stood with God, he would stand for them and he would give their enemy into their hands. But if they continued to worship other gods and to rebel against him, what he told them is this, I will remove the covering that I have put on that city and the Babylonians will come into that land. And that is exactly what they did. Exactly. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. Because I want you to understand our propensity to self-cover. God's continuous offer to cover. And how he said to Judah, if this is what it takes to bring you back, I will show you what happens when I lift my hand off of this land. but I will be your God and I will return you to me and I will shadow you with my hand. Exodus chapter 33, this gorgeous place where 
Moses has a boldness come upon him that is unmatched in all of the Old Testament canon when he just suddenly says to God, show me your glory. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. And Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make, this is God, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, not a rock, the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I will cover you there with my hand. The covering of God personal, intimate. He told Moses, he said, when I remove my hand from you and you and I are gonna see tomorrow that he does not remove his hand at any time from us. But he said to Moses, when I remove my hand from you, you shall see my back, but my face you will not see. Isn't that the way it goes? Because for every true follower of Jesus Christ, We may not see when he arrives in our situation and we may not see how he is carrying us at the time and how he has us covered. But every single time, if we will remain with him, we will see his back. We will be able to say, that was God. That was God. That could only have been God. Only God could have done that. Only God could have done that. We may not see his face. And in your darkest time, what you have to know is this. What you think is just the blackness of the abyss for a child of God is God placing his hand over you in the cleft of the rock. Is it dark? Is it really dark? Is it really dark? Maybe because God has got you covered with his hand. You and I are gonna learn this weekend what it means in Psalm 5, 12 for it to say, You bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. You and I who are in Christ have been covered with favor. And there is nothing we can do to self-cover that we want to trade for divine cover. This is what we want. The cover of God's favor. I want to end you with one place. Luke chapter 8, verse 16. And this is where we'll end. It says, No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Here here is the thing. Here's the thing. What our self-covering is doing if you and I are believers in Christ, is it is covering the light of the Lord Jesus that would have shined through us to people in our midst. When we act like we have not been where people presently are, when we act like we don't know what it's like to have been in unfathomable sin and bondage, and when we keep covering ourselves, What we're doing is we're covering the light that would have shined so brilliantly if we'd had the transparency to say, I've been exactly where you are. I know exactly what this is like. Did you know you can now give through our app to support the show? Thanks for watching Living Proof with Beth Moore. We hope this message encourages you to love and live God's Word. Click subscribe so you won't miss any teaching. Thanks so much for watching.